<laughs> Welcome to the IHCD Global Webcast Horizons in Architectural Education, the Accessible Design Accreditation Initiative. Um, I'm Valerie Fletcher. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Centered Design, uh, your host today. Um, we invite you to use the chat to tell us who you are and where you're from. It's always a pleasure to know the diversity of the attendees. Uh, and we're excited that we have a, a really wonderful crowd today. Um, there will be open captioning throughout the session. After we edit the transcript, we will also make the entire presentation and archive on our, uh, on our website. And also Richard will put it on the ADA uh, Great Plains Center website also. Um, we expect a lively dialogue. A lot of that dialogue we expect will be with you. And that is at the end of our presentation, after Richard and three respondents, we will open the chat uh, and be able to have more of a complete dialogue. Um, and I want to remind you, this is in celebration of the 34th anniversary of the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, that event occurs on Friday, tomorrow. Um, and we are delighted that Richard Sternadori, who is our guest today, has been hard at work for a couple of years at this point and, and making uh, some real progress today on this notion of our, uh, accessible design accreditation initiative. Um, and I want to just note that who we are, since some of the people who are joining us today do not know us, we're a 46-year-old global nonprofit whose mission centers on the role of design and social equity. For us, uh, that means accessibility and inclusive design. Um, and we've been home to one of the 10 federally funded ADA centers since 1996. So that is, that is a core part of who we are. Um, we were pioneers and we are longtime practitioners of inclusive design, constantly evolving. Uh, and for us, inclusive design builds from a base in the United States and around the world, increasingly, of good, accessible design. Our mission-driven practice extends to a very wide range of public and private spaces uh, from coast to coast. We are interested in this initiative for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we have sadly witnessed a decline in the reliability of people's knowledge, architecture in particular, knowledge of accessibility and their responsibilities for compliant accessibility as a baseline uh, in the projects that we see. The second, and that is unfortunately um, a decline since the early 90s, right after the ADA was passed. A pattern we've also witnessed, with, with a few exceptions, I'm happy to say, among our extraordinary young designers uh, who are our interns, co-op students, and fellows. Uh, and their design schools from across the nation, among the most prestigious schools in the country. These are people who have not been exposed whatsoever to notions of accessibility and certainly not to accessibility in their design work. We hope that the ADAI can be a catalyst to a national conversation that results in a greater appetite and skill to practice accessible and inclusive design. Um, as we have said many times before, uh, we quote our old friend, now no longer with us, Ray Lifshay at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, we see architecture as a social art. We hope the people who have joined us today agree. So I will also just let you know we have three uh, generous respondents who are going to be joining us uh, after Richard has finished his presentation. They are Chris Downey. Uh, architect in the Bay Area, known as the Blind Architect, uh, one of our close colleagues and collaborators. We are joined also by Bernadette Muncie, Senior Principal at the Smith Group uh, in the Boston office, and Colt Brock, the current president of the AIA Student Organization. Uh, remember to keep your questions to the end. We're not going to interrupt Richard with questions, but we dearly want to see your questions at the end, and we'll have plenty of time for that at the end. So thanks very much. Uh, Richard, take it away. Valerie, thank you so much and welcome everybody. Uh, I want to first extend my thanks to Valerie Fletcher and IHCD, as well as Gabrielle and PJ <clears throat> there in the IHCD offices. Uh, I'm excited to be here with you all, but this is about you and about your careers, about your work, and in particular about people with disabilities, obviously. Uh, we have some great attendees. Uh, it looks like about 300 plus registered. I see Oshi Harrison from the uh, from the ADA Center and uh, 
quite a few other folks, Troy Balthasor, Charlie Watt, <clears throat> uh, Adrian Moore from Adriana Moore from uh, from Philadelphia. So welcome everybody. I'm excited to be here. And as I mentioned, this is really more about you. So let's just dig right in. I'm going to start sharing my my screen here. Uh, one second, and we will get this going. <clears throat> there we go. Okay. <clears throat> this is my contact information at the University of Missouri. I've been with the University uh, ADA Center. This is the Great Plains ADA Center for about 17 years now. Uh, and uh, we're under the Department of Architectural Studies. We are um, uh, uh, one of the 10 ADA centers across the country. And uh, this is, as I say, about my 17th year. Prior to that, I was a building official. I'm still recovering from those 15 years. So that's that's kind of my background. And um, I want to, again, point out the Institute for Human Centered Design. Valerie gave you a great introduction, but there's their contact information. And at the beginning slide, my introductory slide and my end slide, you will find my email and other contact means if you've got questions or you want to extend this conversation. Uh, as I mentioned, we are the ADA Center uh, Region 7, and we have 10 centers, for those of you who don't know, across the United States and in Puerto Rico and the uh, Virgin Islands, et cetera. And I believe we have some people from Puerto Rico here. We have Great Britain, Japan. I don't even know where all the, all the folks are coming from, but it's wonderful to have you all here. Our ADA centers were created by the Congress in 1991 after the passage of the ADA because there was a recognition of the complexity of the law involving employment, involving architecture, involving so many different aspects of life and access into society for people with disabilities. So consequently, our ADA centers have been consistently funded for the last 34 years, uh, tomorrow, of course, being the anniversary, but we have been consistently funded by the Congress, grant funded through the Department of Health and Human Services, to do the work that we're doing here today. And we all share an 800 number. So if you're dialing from Colorado, you're gonna get the region eight office. If you're dialing from Oregon, you're gonna get the region 10 office, et cetera. And we all pretty much know each other. Uh, there's about 200 plus uh, staff and directors, employees across these 10 centers. Uh, and somebody in our staff is gonna know something about your question no matter what it is. And I'm constantly amazed at the levels of expertise. Our ADA Center, as, as well as the New England one, are renowned for their architectural work and understood to have focused on that over the years in terms of research and outreach and development. Our center is located at the University of Missouri in Columbia, where, as I mentioned, we're part of the Department of Architectural Studies. Part of the work we do is called technical assistance. We also do capacity building, helping communities to build their own capacity, whether it's the city and county government or whether it's state government or it's private enterprise to uh, increase their services and enhance their abilities to serve people with disabilities. In the meantime, we do this technical assistance on a daily basis. Part of that might be reviewing blueprints or just answering questions like, the five I've answered in the last 20 minutes here that come across my emails regarding construction design, application of the ADA, application of the building code, et cetera. So you're here today to learn about the ADAI, the Accessible Design Accreditation Initiative. This was a, a brainstorm I had a few years ago that I brought to our faculty and our dean at our college, our chair of our architectural studies department, and it was well received. The, the idea of focusing in on accessible design as its own topic. And I'm not gonna talk about inclusive or universal design. To me, those are a little bit, uh, they're great, but they take away from the focus, the tight focus that the ADA and the building code 
and the entire understanding architecturally of how they apply in society. Uh, I, I think that universal design and inclusive design have their place, but that's not what we're here about today. The ADAI began, as I say, with our own school and faculty and the idea that we could do, uh, we could provide a more rigorous education for those young architects and, <clears throat> excuse me, interior designers coming out of the academic system and going in, sitting for the ARE or moving on into their internships, et cetera. So our proposal that you're going to learn about here today is that uh, university and college architectural and interior design programs integrate new academic learning objectives for the students that are based on the foundational principles of the 2010 ADA standards, as well as the International Code Council IBC and ICC A117 documents. Those, the idea, the goal here is to improve the lives of people with disabilities. But we're also looking at enhancing the academic experience. We're looking at enhancing the field and industry of architecture as well, because obviously these young graduating people, they're looking for jobs. And so there's there's a direct link to their ability to provide a firm or a client with uh, absolute understanding of what are actually laws and, and adopted provisions, regulations federally, as well as provisions that are adopted by your state and local governments under the auspices of the building code. But we're gonna go beyond compliance because compliance isn't sexy, right? Meeting the ADA, when people tell me they meet the ADA or the building code, as a former code official, I always want to offer my sympathies because you've actually done the worst you can do legally without crossing a line toward enforcement, right? So those are the minimums, but we're going to go beyond that today and talk about the sociological and cultural applications of education and how that ties into this uh, understanding of our young architects and interior designers. <clears throat> this is a collaborative effort, and that's why we're, we're so excited to have you all here today, because we need you involved in this. And uh, when I presented this at the ADA Symposium in May, um, we had a huge crowd, and a couple of people said, I was on stage, it looked like a TED Talk, said, said I look like Jerry Lewis with Jerry's kids at the telethon. Try, trying to get everybody to call in and contribute. It's the same here, it, whereas we're looking for more collaboration. And I'll explain who is on board now. We've got about 45 people that have signed on to this, including the um, including some very high profile agencies, uh, organizations, and people involved in codes development, accessible design, education, direct service to people with disabilities. The ADAI as a package has been introduced to the four accreditation agencies who give the universities and colleges their, their validation. So as the students graduate, they are able to sit for the ARE or the other examinations that provide licensure. What we have found in our experience throughout my 17 years at the ADA Center, as well as colleagues, is that we can enhance that education and, and focus in on that more clearly. And that's what we're talking about with the ADAI. These are the current, some of the current supporters. So I'm gonna, not gonna read them all, but of course, importantly, we've got the United States Access Board. Dr. Pavathron has thrown his weight behind this and is excited to be part of this. The International Code Council uh, just recently uh, announced that they will be co-branding this with us which will take it out of the, just out of this theoretical framework that we're in at the moment, if you will, the, the beta testing it and take it into the real world, take it into Canada, et cetera. Uh, we've got the A117 committee, all 10 ADA centers signed on, the American Society of Interior Designers, Association of Licensed Architects, IHCD with Valerie, et cetera, uh, Paralyzed Veterans, United Spinal, the list goes on and on. Um, Accessibility, Accessibility Professionals Association, Division of the State Architect, California, Cassie. So there's more than this, but I'm trying to give you a sense of th this is coming, the support for this is coming from all angles and from all kinds of different 
levels of involvement in architecture in design and in accessible design. So I don't have time, we don't have time to read them all, but I think the important thing here is to understand that we're building a coalition, we're building a groundswell and it's collaborative. Consequently, the work you're going to see today is partially collaborative, but it's based on the origins and how I brought this forward to the accreditation agencies that are involved in providing the schools with their validation, as well as the people that and agencies here uh, that we're discussing as supporters. We're hoping that you will consider coming on board as a supporter and more, and we'll talk about that toward the end, how you can contribute and the different means we've got that we're still developing. Uh, that's the important thing here is this is still developing and we're trying to get, you know, we're trying to get this uh, off the ground, if you will. Um, it's the uh, lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Uh, as we bring it to the accreditation agencies, we want to show them the value of this to the schools, to the students, to the people with disabilities, obviously, to that largest minority in the United States, and uh, obviously to firms and et cetera. So as I mentioned earlier, we at the 10 ADA centers provide technical assistance as well as other services. And as part of our DHHS grant funding, we keep track of those services every quarter and report them quarterly to the Department of Health and Human Services in what's called the OMS database system. It's not worth knowing about that. But as we began, to, as I began to recognize some patterns in my own technical assistance day to day over the years, I began to realize that I'm getting questions from highly seasoned professionals that in fact seem to me to be pedestrian or to be uh, questions I would not expect from licensed architects or seasoned professionals about accessible design. And I was also getting them from young graduates and people starting out in firms and others in the industry or related industries. So we report quarterly to our federal grantor and um, I saw a, a trend. I took a six year period and I actually boiled that down a couple of different ways for some of the charts that are in front of you here. For those of you uh, without sight or with with uh, sight impairments, this is this is a chart showing the contact methods uh, across a period of time. I actually think this is probably just one quarter based on 170 phone calls, 49 emails like that, website uh, outreach. And then the second chart here shows the primary contact role of the persons reaching out to us for technical assistance. So as I mentioned, we do this quarterly. And as you can see, individuals with a disability in this particular quarter represent about 29% of the technical assistance that was outreach. And I had one to this morning, as a matter of fact, regarding design of hearing systems from a person who is in advocacy for uh, the hearing impaired. And so individuals with a disability or family members with a disability, uh, as you look down that site, uh, down that column there, the chart, there are 21 different roles in society, if you will, or persons, college students, attorneys, code officials, sometimes it's unknown category, employers, but architect and design professional came in and the number six spot here, uh, and that's not uncommon. And in fact, they often come in number two and three quarterly. And then when you uh, expand that out, not, not conflating it, but when you expand it out, we find that that trend holds true across the year and across multiple years where architects and designers are generally in the top five of the thousands and thousands of calls our 10 ADA centers get or the emails we get with questions on accessibility. And almost, almost all of them, I would say two thirds, and I'll show you why I know that, are related to design. And, uh, what we see uh, in, in this case, uh, I believe this was 2022. I don't have 2023's data yet, uh, but uh, this is coalesced data from the 10 centers. 
uh, we had uh, 10,095 requests for technical assistance. And in 2022, architects and design professionals were the number four category of those requests. And, you know, this is data. It's a little bit boring, right? Data is always dry. Research is always dry. But from a, a more of a, a, a standpoint of our own experiences as uh, as my colleagues across our 10 centers all have seen, this is this is not just a fad, this is a trend we've all dealt with. And we kept wondering why, when in fact these are based, the, the 2010 standards as well as the international codes are, are obligatory for every project, practically, unless you're building a barn in the middle of Iowa, maybe. So consequently, we wondered why it is and, and what's going on why it is we're getting questions that sometimes are, are, I'll tell you some of the questions we get are, what book do I open? Where do I find the information? Which is a little bit scary after 34 years of the ADA being in place. So moving on to the next slide, uh, I'm showing you some of the standardized topics that we deal with. And you can see here in this case in 2022 on this chart, Facility access was the number one topic. 19% of the calls, and this was a quarter, this was a quarter in 2022, not the full year. The full year. We had requests on reasonable accommodation, which of course is employment, reasonable modification of policy and procedures, which is a Title II ADA issue that may involve architecture. Service animals may involve architecture, obviously non-discrimination, enforcement questions. These are the same questions that we aren't teaching. These are the same models that the colleges and universities may be able to absorb into and integrate into their systems. And we'll talk about how we might approach that and how that might be a realistic way. Uh, obviously housing. Now housing under the ADA, was that was a very low amount of questions in this particular quarter. The reason being that there are only three categories of housing under the ADA itself. And those would be housing associated with schools or any level of education, uh, housing with uh, property that is leased or built with, uh, that is leased back to the public and built with public funds or lodging, hotels, motels, et cetera. So those are the only three categories. I'm, I'm, kind, of, I'm kind of bringing that, uh, summarizing those. But then you do have the Fair Housing Act and HUD. You have the International Building Code and the A117. So you've got other housing and let's say dwelling regulations to consider, but that's not part of the ADA. So we're not gonna go down that road here today. The point here being that facility access represented about two thirds of the phone calls we had from architects or the emails that we had from architects. And they were looking for that technical assistance under titles two and three of the ADA, title two being state and local government application, title three being public accommodation, which would be doctors offices walmarts all of your all of your uh, factories manufacturing those kinds of things <clears throat> so two thirds of the technical assistance provided to architects uh 68% more than two thirds uh were uh that, were that was the topic excuse me facility access and then within that we drill down even further in our reporting and get into what's called information or complex information well uh, uh when you begin to talk about those technical assistance questions more than three quarters of them within this 68 percent of technical assistance were in fact on complex information where you're spending a great deal of time sort of delving through the ADA or the building code and trying to work through that. And by the way, we generally don't interpret the, the international building code, even though I have that background and, and some credentials there, uh, but we do work very closely with the code council and they've been very wonderful in their collaborations with us. So we have those, we have that, uh, those contacts. Uh, and why, you know, I'm showing you data and I'm talking about sort of our experience as technical assistance wizards across the United States. But when I saw the Hunters Point Library project and lawsuits for a $43 million project built just five years ago, so 30 years into the ADA, I really, it, it really set me off. 
wondering how could how could we have allowed and how could the design team as well as the building officials or the building department responsible for the review of blueprints allowed for some of the discrepancies in access to this brand new building, gorgeous building with a gorgeous viewscape of the city of New York. And you can see on your slide here, there are three photos and the one on the right is a, tier, a series of three tiers of bookshelves and study corral that are only accessible by a set of stairs. Now in this photograph, there are books on those shelves, but in the more recent photos, those books have been removed. The response of the library was, oh, we'll send someone from the library staff to browse for you through the books. Okay, it's Title II. Yeah, I guess from a programmatic access standpoint, program access, that's possible, but it's it's not going to hold up because browsing is is a personal thing. And you're not going to be able to browse for me as well as I can browse for myself, right? And so browsing is is not something, a service that I think would be very effective and might not hold up if there were litigation brought forward on this particular design. And that's exactly what happened. The litigation followed. And this is not the only shortcoming in the building or in the design. And I we don't have time to go into all of it. But this, to me, represented sort of the the keystone in the arch or the kingpin. If, if this could collapse, then what else is happening? Because here we have a very renowned architectural firm. <clears throat> we have a high profile building paid for by tax dollars and very exciting building and exciting location and a public building, no less, that isn't allowing public access to several areas. That shouldn't have happened. And our goal is that it is that we diminish that possibility by educating upcoming architects and interior designers. Because the realities of their learning objectives in school right now may, and I'm going to emphasize that word, may include some exposure to the 2010 ADA standards or the ADAG, you hear it called, and to the International Code council documents, the building code and the A117, but it's may include. So as I went through my master's, uh, I had two weeks out of 16 on codes and standards at that time. And this is no reflection on our current department, but I had two weeks out of 16 on codes and standards. And during those two weeks that we covered codes and standards, we just were given some cut and paste charts out of the codes about fire ratings and height and area limitations in the design. We had a couple of issues with wheelchair access like that in bathrooms and exiting, and that was about it. If you had asked me as I was graduating, where do I turn to get answers for compliance, just minimum compliance, I could answer you as a former code official, but I could not answer you as a student. So these are pivotal documents and they're, they're minimum standards, but they have a significant role in society for people with disabilities. And, and I believe that that role after graduation needs to be reflected before graduation. The significance and impact of the role after graduation is not matched by most curricula. I can't speak for all schools. There are some great, great schools out there and I'm hoping a lot of them are joining us today and we need you. But how we get there is, is falling apart. As uh, Valerie mentioned earlier, we're seeing a decline in accessible understanding. And I think that the trends I've shown you in the recent, some of the recent graphs and tables validate or verify that. There are some critical questions, and these are some of the questions that we get from licensed <laughs> designers. And when we talk about learning objectives within the schools, I think these are questions that need to be included in the curriculum, questions that need to be understood by the students. And so we're getting out of compliance issues so much now, and we're talking about that overview, that 40,000 foot view of the industry itself. And that would be, what are the federal ADA and model 
code standards. Again, where do I find them? What are the books? Who are those authors? Who, where do they come from? What's the origin? How do I establish compliance? And who's the interpreter of compliance? Is it, is it the local code official? A lot of students don't know that it might just be the DOJ or the Office of Civil Rights, or it might just be your local code official. What are the, how are the model codes developed and enforced? How are the ADA accessibility standards developed and enforced? Where do the students even find these documents? Uh, what are the major topics and themes in the, in the standards? And that's foundational. That's where we're going to go when we talk about learning objectives. We're going to touch base and begin to delve into those topics and themes that are, let's say, universal, fundamental, and foundational and will not change regardless of the adoption of any particular edition of the building code, or regardless of if the Access Board and the Department of Justice revise this 2012 standard, it won't matter. Because we're talking about the reality of experiencing a building with vision impairment and blindness, or in a chair, or with other mobility devices or impairments, or with hearing impairments, chemical sensitivities, et cetera. What are those thematic experiences for people using your buildings and facilities and sites. That's the key. So how do we get to that? And what are the differences between these two standards? Because they're not really fully harmonized. There's a harmonization committee. It's been around 22 plus years. I've worked with them on and off. They're still at busy. They're still at, at, at work. And I can tell you the meetings last four or five hours going through minutia you wouldn't believe. But that's how it has to go. And um, what are the issues with religious entities and private entities? There's a difference there. Uh, how do these standards that we're talking about impact licensure for these graduates, the firms themselves, the, the careers, the long-term careers, litigation to the firm and the projects? And then finally, how does accessible design, most importantly, impact the lives of the end users of the buildings, which may not just be people with disabilities, right? So the realities of these built environments is that you as a designer, for those of you who are designers, have to juggle about 500 pages. So the 2010 ADA standards on the left side of your screen here, the white and black document, is almost 300 pages total, whereas the provisions in the International Building Code and the A117, the accessibility provisions of chapter 1, 2, and 11, 10 and 11, of the building code itself and the A117 are approximately 200 pages total. Can you teach 500 pages in four years of academic education? One year, 16 weeks? That's the question. And obviously not. And we don't expect that. The ADAI is not intending to delve into that level of minutia. There is no single curriculum that could cover all that material. And furthermore, what's the impact on the university or the college and the program itself? And we'll get into that because that's the critical point here is how is this integrated into existing curricula? <clears throat> so this is our approach and uh, we'll dig into it. I'm showing you uh, two slides here. When I talk about those 500 pages of both the federal standards and the building code, we are talking about, again, I'm going to use the word minutia. It's the best word, right? We're talking about floor plans, charts. We're talking about elevations, graphs, ratios, graphics. We're talking about dimensional characteristics. We're talking about text. We're talking about advisory notes. We are talking about such depth I've taken these next two slides. I think there's about um, 30 some odd slides. This is a screenshot from another program I teach. The program that you're looking at, this is just, I don't know, 30 some odd slides out of about 490 of a full day program teaching the 2010 ADA standards to their fullest depth that I have in my capacity. And the next slide is the same, just giving you some idea of that depth that you must go into to be compliant. And again, I don't want to just use compliance. Remember that when we talk about these documents, 
the people developing them and the people on the harmonization committee, the people on the U.S. Access Board, I can promise you that those boards, commissions, committees that I have worked with over these years, that I've sat on as a member, in fact, are people with disabilities. These are not just somebody's idea, okay? This is research. This is based on empirical research, experiential research, outcome-based research, where these people with blindness, deafness, mobility, reaching and grasping, chemical sensitivities, I could go on, right? It could, it could be something, an invisible disability, have developed the anthropometrics and ergonomics behind these designs. These aren't just somebody's idea. These are the way we know it's safer to design a building and more accessible. So when we talk about those minimums and meeting them, this is critical information when you think about the fact that these weren't just developed willy-nilly. This, this is critical detail. But can you teach that level of detail? These 500 slides I have in, in another teaching program that I give, uh, no, there's no way you're going to get to that depth. I would, I would congratulate any school that attempted it. And I'd be, I'd be hard pressed as a teacher to do it myself in 16 weeks or in a full academic year to a student so that I could ensure their learning outcome. So I could test their learning outcome, validate their learning outcome and be ensured that they could move on and matriculate. That's where we are. So those, that's the how. The compliance is the how of learning objectives. The compliance is the how of the design standards of the books of the minimums, right? Now let's talk a little bit about the ADAI and why. Because there's a much bigger picture. And these are some quotes, uh, my, <laughs> my own verbiage. Uh, accessibility standards operate within an intertwined personal, medical, cultural, regulatory, right? That's what we're here about. Anthropometric, ergonomic, and public health framework. Those taken together constitute the daily life of a person with a disability who's got to manipulate their wheelchair and take out their, their bag to empty the toilet in, in a urinal in the bathroom or wiping down every mirror they can find in total darkness with, with their blindness as they're looking for soap dispensers and towels in a bathroom and having to ask someone for help and humiliate themselves just to find the water or the soap or the towel. That's the reality. And that's the why. So these minimum standards, they deserve a prominence in education that they have in the real life of people with disabilities and in you as designers or in you as advocates or in you as the schools. I found this quote at the bottom of this slide, and it's my verbiage again, but I was really excited to find it several times across LinkedIn and, and some other social media sites where it says that inspiring the future generation of designers toward a more empathic and deeper cultural understanding of the challenges faced by people with disabilities is equally as important as teaching the technical applications. <clears throat> I'm gonna repeat that. Understanding those cultural challenges and those physical challenges is equally important as getting to just minimum compliance, the technical standards. The ADAI approaches the education of our students in that exact way. We're not saying just teach compliance. We're saying teach the foundations of compliance and then bring students empathically into the world. So I'm hoping Kendall Nicholson is here with us. Kendall Nicholson is a researcher with ACSA, uh, the Association for Collegiate uh, Scholarly uh, Accreditation, and a wonderful gentleman. He was our guest at the symposium in May, and he had not attended a previous symposium. And he came up to me, I think it was on the second or third day after being immersed in our educational programs over those four days, being with people, uh, networking, people with disabilities, all of the events that happened. And he, the first thing he said to me was, I had no idea. It's that level of empathy and not just empathy, it's, it's understanding, it's, it's compassion. And I find most designs, designers are very, very open to this to being compassionate and understanding the realities of the end user of their buildings. I mean, after all, that's building typology and morphology, isn't it? That's, that's taught. We teach that morphology 
and typology of a building. Who are those end users and what are their needs? And Kendall was wonderful. We, we're so excited. We hope he's going to teach for us next year at our symposium, which is in, I believe it's in May, and it's going to be in um, Atlanta, Georgia. So I hope you'll join us for that. Oh, okay. So I got us through the how, and we're getting a little bit into the why. We're a little more than halfway through our slides, uh, I, and I'd like to go through them in this depth. I may, I may speed it up a little. I felt like the choke point to all of this that I've been describing to you is in fact the schools. And that's not to diminish or in any way disparage the schools. I love my school, I love MU, I love our program. I, I'm a graduate, I mean, I, I love it. But the point isn't that they're not doing a good job. When you think about the accreditation industry and you think about the education industry and you think about the codes development industry, there are three separate industries that have evolved in their service to society in their own directions and to the needs of their membership and the needs of the people they serve and their constituents. That's perfectly acceptable. That's the way life is and that's how it should go. But I think we need to reconsider uh, coalescing those three industries and the point where it would be best to do that, where we can do the, the most good, the most effective, is with our schools. And I believe that they're best poised to offer a more formal and measurable exposure to these standards and to the why, the cultural, socio sociological aspects of disabilities, to our upcoming graduates. Because as a person who works teaching AIA approved courses and ICC approved courses and have worked with both of those entities over the years, uh, and as a code official, I see that our symposium, while we offered almost 40 health, safety, and welfare credit hours this last June, is a poor substitute, and I love our symposium, it's a poor substitute for a four-year formal education. We don't do examination. We don't do peer-reviewed uh, research or require the students to do that. We don't do studio. I mean, studio is where it happens for the students, right? Studio in architecture is where the magic begins and where their personality and what they believe in about design comes forward. We don't teach that and we don't test them and they don't get four years of focused curricula when they go to, let's say, an AIA two-day event or three-day event or even our symposium or today. So getting those credits and keeping up with licensure, obviously critical, obviously wonderful. We invite and welcome all education, no matter what it, where it comes from, but it's falling short in terms of what we could be doing with our schools, those condensed and sporadic educational events are just not a substitute. Okay, kicked that dead horse enough, didn't I? So within studio, ADAI learning objectives are critical. I think studio is where a lot of it happens and thanks to Valerie for helping me understand and pointing that out and, and helping me sort of parse that out because as we get into the guidance of how we might approach this with schools, this is gonna be the critical, I think one of the critical, as, critical aspects because studio is that uniquely positioned uh, offering or if you will, event in academia that allows the students to begin flowering their own perspectives and passions. And maybe it is disabilities, maybe it's not. It may be their interests in a certain project but the ADAI is focused on both that how and the why, the compliance and the humanist side of this. So um, a teacher who has the skills and abilities, a mentor at a university or a college can bring a tighter focus during studio. And that can be paired with, let's say, plan development and even plan review during studio that might include other students in the cohort and beginning to work together to understand how accessibility could have happened better or is in fact being really addressed, not just from a minimum standpoint, but maybe even from a universal or inclusive standpoint. Uh, with that deeper empathy, empathy and understanding uh, of that matrix I expressed earlier, medical, personal, uh, sociological, 
architectural, that matrix and that framework that people with disabilities live within every day, understanding that will help a student and help a university program to better address the needs of the end users, people with disabilities in this case, right? And that can be applied as a reimagining or a student can begin to first think about the site, the environment, the project brief, the potential constraints on a project, the typology the opportunities based on form and function, not just style. So when I was a code official, we would review, review blueprints. And I did that for a lot of years. I was a certified plan reviewer. I was a certified code official. My plan reviewers in my department um, oftentimes what we would see would be a whole series of, of prints and you'd look at your cover sheet of your, of your documents and you would eventually find a plan sheet, a, a code conformance or a code sheet, sometimes it's called, where the designers would have laid out the building, plumbing, mechanical, electrical, maybe it wouldn't be the ADA, it might be the building code, however, and they would have laid out exactly what, you know, where you'll find what and what documents and what uh, standards they reference in those different codes. Uh, we often found that accessibility was an afterthought as if you were doing mylar overlays and you design the whole building and then you go, oh, by the way, accessibility. Yeah, we need to do, you know, we need, don't, let's not forget that. Let's add that in now. My approach to it is really more like, let's start with that and let's be inclusive with that education during all of the other education that architects have, which is substa substantial and, and ongoing, obviously. Uh, there are perspectives in studio informing learning objectives uh, that I feel the ADAI offers flexibility for, similar to the WELL standard or the WELL-FIT standard, um, that because this is about well-being and impact on human health, right? It really is. And so what about accessibility as a human scale design? Accessibility as improving what's already good design, but including it during the earliest design phases. Accessibility as a function of civil rights, because it is, right? Adaptive versus accessible design in housing. Now, I don't wanna go into housing too deeply, but then you can take that same idea of performance versus prescriptive accessible design. There's nothing constraining you to use this book if you can meet the performance standards. Accessible design compliance on local and federal levels, aging in place, extended care in housing and employment centers, and then ways of thinking about accessible design, which can include inclusive, universal, accessible design approaches, and then breaking it down into things like existing facilities, alterations, and new construction. These are perspectives that I think need to be brought forward for the students. How do we do that? So now we're gonna get into the meat of this a little bit, and then we'll get into the obstacles that we still face because we are still in development on this. This is a, a project, this is a, a project in, in, uh, in development. And so the what I did was develop a, to write what I call the best practices guide. It's right now about 11 pages is all, but it's a draft. And it's the idea of capturing those fundamentals I mentioned of how it is to experience a building with, uh, let's say, a vision impairment. What are the foundations of both documents, both of those how compliance documents, and then how do we apply that in school? And how do we begin to think about that as educators for our students or as designers themselves, right? So the learning comp the learning learning outcomes. Um, well, let me back up. The, those best that best practice guidance. I'm going to show you a little bit of it. Uh, introduces students to those foundations that include human, legal, technical, ergonomic, cultural, medical, etc. And remembering that those are in fact developed by people with those impairments. They're not. They're not arbitrary. But they are minimums. The learning outcomes that we're going to hope to present in the future in the schools through collaboration with the four accreditation agencies are a comprehension, a viable comprehension of the underlying principles of accessible design and what interacting with a site or a facility or even an element means. And we're endorsing those accredited metrics of how and why of designing those facilities for people with disabilities. 
the best practice guidance is modeled on the 10 chapters of the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. I needed a framework in which to begin to coalesce both the building code and the 2010 standards. I needed something where I could begin to, to pour in all of the recipe, all of the ingredients to come out with a recipe for those foundational systems that, that are never going to change. I, I shouldn't say that. We certainly, we're certainly seeing AI, we're seeing technologies, robotics, et cetera, et cetera. We're seeing a lot of changes in architecture and in medical approaches to accessibility and in the lives of people with disabilities. But I can tell you that from, a, from the end user standpoint, there's a lot of things that will never change. So the content of the foundational principles of the best practices guidance includes both the ADA standards and the ICC building code and A117 documents. Uh, those foundational principles represent the basics of interacting with those sites, facilities, buildings, and elements. And rather than attempting to teach all of those charts, tables, graphics, et cetera, that I showed you in, in that enormously complex uh, educational program I have of almost 500 slides, we instead are looking at giving the documents of that 40,000 foot view of the overarching topics, chapters and purposes of those chapters. Here is a screenshot of the best, the cover page of the best practices guide. Actually, this is, I'm gonna take that back. This is not the cover page. This is uh, really just um, the begin. This is getting into the document at the beginning of it. And it says, you know, the accessible design and accreditation initiative is a methodology for developing a broader understanding and more robust application of accessible design principles within the professions of architecture and interior design. I won't go into and read this whole thing, but going on to the next page, <clears throat> I will show you the 10 chapters here. I've taken the 10 chapters, as I mentioned, and coalesced very on, on a very cursory level the each of these chapters and the elements within the two documents, the building code and the ADA standards, into project administration, into scoping. In other words, when and how many do I do of this toilet or this water fountain scoping? The building blocks, floor, the floors, uh, accessible turning radiuses, et cetera, et cetera. The building blocks, the larger marbles, uh, the accessible routes, site and building elements, parking, um, ramps, et cetera, plumbing facilities and elements, one of the more larger and complex chapters, uh, communication features, elements and principles. Uh, when we get to chapter eight, use and occupancy, special room and space, I'm gonna give you an example of the non-harmonization and how this foundational document, the best practices guide, can begin to inform a curricula. So the ICC model codes right now list 10 occupancy classification as well as 26 subcategories, imagine. So that's quite a few, right? What do we have? Five assembly, we have three or four institutional, we have three or four educational, we have business, we have separate uh, assembly, of uh, separate business. So you have these categories and subcategories of how a building is used and who's going to use it, occupancy and use group. Okay, that's the foundational issue, and that's an important one to teach to our designers, but that's not in the ADA standards. The ADA standards covers accessibility, but covers uh, the chapter eight is special rooms and spaces. That's almost basically it. We'll cover some restaurant stuff, some assembly stuff, but assembly to the ADA standards is entirely different than the four or five assembly occupancies under the building code. How do you teach that? Well, you can't delve into that depth, obviously. In a curricula, you'd spend all 16 weeks on this topic, on assembly. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you should. Maybe eight weeks on assembly in a summer course. But the point being that this is what we're going to run into. These are the, the choke points and the obstacles that schools will face. Built-in elements, it's just like it sounds. And then recreation, chapter 10 of the 2010 ADA standards. I found this great quote. I love this. Recreation, uh, this is from Plato, who said you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than in a year of conversation. 
And I think that's really amazing and, and absolutely true. And if Bill Botton is with us from the Access Board, uh, salute to Bill on your retirement. Congratulations and wonderful job on developing Chapter 10 that never existed before the 2010 standards and putting it into a usable format and understandable format that takes into account how important recreation is. Because recreation is not about how big my muscles look or how far I can run. It's about longevity of life. It's about having buoyancy in the water of a swimming pool or spa that you don't have in your wheelchair and experiencing that loss of gravity for just a short time while you're swimming or about extending the life of a child or the social social ability and learning education, learning outcomes and education of a child in play because it is learning for children. This is pages, uh, I think this is pages two and three. This is where I begin to take those 10 chapters, project administration, chapter one, and I coalesce the information from chapter one. Students gain exposure to the scope, applicability, enforcement dynamics between the ADA regs and the ICC model codes. Manipulating the two standards for a project is pivotal to professional success, to risk reduction, project timetables, and other firm client considerations. And then we get into what we should expose the students to, the mechanisms of using the model codes in conjunction with the ADA standards. You can't have one without the other now. You can't have accessibility for accessible means of egress without both documents. You can't have door and corridor with, uh, app, uh, pardon me, occupant loading factors. All of those things are found only in the model codes, but apply to the 2010 standards and are referenced over and over. So that's project administration example. Scoping, again, we get into a lot of questions that are in both documents, but are maybe slightly different. And sometimes they're well harmonized. And one of those that you're probably all familiar with is that 20% disproportionality rule, where we're going to expand the scope of an, of an alteration by adding 20% of the cost of that alteration to the path of travel to get to the alteration. That's one of the biggest questions we still get from licensed professionals. Chapter three is building blocks again, where we will look at coalescing floor and ground surfaces, change, changes in levels, maneuvering spaces, which by the way has changed dramatically. Maneuvering spaces, accessible routes in the building code now, if, if most communities have adopted the latest editions of the IBC and A117, they're going to be using the work from Dr. Steinfeld's study, the SUNY uh, New York State University study on anthropometrics, of uh, wheel device anthropometrics that Dr. Steinfeld piloted. And I'm hoping Ed is with us today and joins us in this collaboration. That study has expanded the size of wheelchair footprints, the turning radiuses, the T turns, the size of corridors, the 90 degree turns. It goes on and on folks, and it's not harmonized with the 2010 standards. So as a designer and as a student, you're going to need to have both documents in hand and understand both and how they apply to your project. That's pretty complicated. Chapter four is accessible routes, same thing. So here I've given you just a very brief draft of the best practices guidance and how that might inform on a, on a foundational approach and educational format, the learning outcomes of any curricula. Because as I mentioned, there is no one single class that could serve every school. Every program is different. And the accreditation agencies all have different metrics for measuring those schools and validating their system, their faculty, their program, et cetera. So uh, I'm showing you here a little repeat of project administration. I won't go through that. Uh, scoping again, this is what I just talked about. Chapter one, uh, chapter two, scoping, chapter three, building blocks. Also throughout this best practices guidance, I've provided what I'm calling the take home message, which might be similar to the advisory notes in the 2010 standards or in the building code, we have advisories that take the intent and the plain English. What were the committees thinking? The people with blindness, the people who are experts in measuring uh, the anthropometrics of the use of a toilet in a room and reaching for a grab bar or a shower control. What were their thoughts and intentions in the provisions and the minimums? So I've created these take-home messages throughout the best practices guidance 
that takes into account and explains where we get to these things, such as Dr. Steinfeld's study from 2009, uh, the Domino's Pizza versus uh, Robles uh, LLC and Lucky Brand versus David New lawsuits that occurred regarding, uh, regarding uh, accessibility of websites, huge topic. We're not teaching those. So there, there are obstacles for the schools, as you can begin to see, I think here. What is the type of program or licensure being offered by the, by the school? What are the expectations and interests of the students? How do you integrate this ADAI into your existing credit hour constraints, 120 credit hours, add a master's degree, now you're up to 180 maybe, add a PhD, what are you up to? So integrating your ADAI into that is going to be difficult for some schools. Just finding the room in that map, in those credit hours, will not be easy for some schools. Some may already be doing a lot of this or some of this, but it still needs to be validated and verified by ACSA, NAAB, CEDA, those groups, okay. and CARB examinations, et cetera. In integrating that ADAI into the curricula, determining what's workable and what might need, need to be revised in the current curricula. What are the knowledge, skills, and abilities of the faculty themselves? Are they ready for this? Can they bring this to a student in such a way that the light bulb goes off for the student? And it turns that student on. They get that passion, that bliss to stay up till 3 a.m. to finish a blueprint or to finish a studio model that in fact captures their passion about accessibility the way I did. What are the expectations? Uh, what, what are the systems by, by which the school is accredited? Because again, some accredited agencies, agencies, accreditation agencies, pardon me, will use quantitative and others use a more qualitative approach to understanding how a school works and graduating students who are ready for their examinations and licensure. What are the expectations of the parents who are paying for this a lot of times, right? The alumni, the donors, there's a political reality to schools. And then sitting for those examinations. So you see, these are some of the obstacles that we are facing, that schools are facing. And how can you help? I don't know how you can help. You know how you can help. If you've paid attention, and I hope you have, you have a better idea of your networking, of your colleagues, of your understanding of this industry than I do in some aspects. And you can maybe reach out as Valerie reached out to me and said, Rich, let's do a webinar. And you know what? She reached out to me on late Friday night, just six days ago and to put this together. That's amazing to me that we have almost 300 registrants in six days and just a, a great, I hopefully a great program to, to bring people into the fold here. We're building a movement. We need to have conversations with the schools themselves. Landscape architects have been, I've it totally ignored landscape architecture. Uh, I've, I've ignored housing because this is enough of a task right now. As this coalesces and as this becomes, hopefully becomes part of the accessibility accreditation, or pardon me, university accreditations, we can begin to integrate those other disciplines such as landscape architecture into this project or process. But we need you to distribute this information. This webinar will be available, recorded and available to you to use over and over and to distribute. I'm glad to meet with your groups and discuss it with them. Uh, and again, present a webinar like this to your own groups. But I don't know exactly how you can help. I only hope you will. And you'll join the amazing colleagues such as the Access Board and the Code Council, and you name it. I don't want to leave names out here, but my gosh, we've got Cassie, we've got amazing people and, 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 uh, and, and organizations behind this now. And we need your engagement uh, because this is not going to happen by itself. This will die on the vine if we don't keep up with it. So how do you do that? Well, I've got some suggestions besides just contacting me or having us repeat the seminar. But obviously, uh, there's a synergy that happens, right? Now, the four accreditation agencies or the people involved in accreditation, they hold a conference. It's been called the Accreditation uh, Review Forum, I believe, ARF. And um, it's generally every five years, but I think with COVID, 
It should have been this year if it's a five-year cycle, but it may be next year or even 2027. I want to go to that. I want to be invited to that. I want to bring the ADAI to their agenda because that is where the accreditation agencies and the ICC and the AIA and all the big players involved in university curricula, involved in accreditation, involved in codes development, involved in disability uh, design, in fact, come together and review what are those accreditation protocols and standards and then revise them. That's where this needs to be. And hopefully that'll happen. And with your help, it could. You can write to these people. I've provided their emails here. And you can emphasize what you may think as the importance of this ADAI in getting involved at that architectural review forum and just in general. And I'll tell you right now, we've had great response from um, people like Kimberly Dowdell at AIA. She was our keynote at AIA, our closing keynote. Kendall Nicholson, I mentioned earlier. And there's a lot of folks here. I've provided emails of the presidents of ACSA, AIA, um, uh, and NCARB, et cetera. And I'm not going to name each one, but these are the these are the pivotal people with the knowledge and the authority and the ability to get this thing off the ground with us. Right. And so I've provided all their information. Some of them are sitting in today and I'm welcome and so excited that you could be here. And, and I hope this takes hold and you as participants reach out to these people and let them know your opinion. Let them know what you think of the direction accessibility has taken and how and where you think it may need to go for our students. These are those key contacts. And I'll close with this. Dr. Pavithron is the executive director at the Access Board. And when he wrote his letter of support, he said, quote, your ADAI program will undoubtedly improve the lives of people with disabilities, the education of design students, the built environment, something we haven't talked much about, improving the built environment for generations to come, and the academic and technical professions. We welcome the opportunity to be of service as this innovative proposal to the accreditation agencies moves forward. I was touched by that statement from Dr. Pavathan, and I'm hoping he's joining us here. These are my references, and that closes out this portion of the webinar. I've been at it a little more than an hour. There is my contact information, and I don't know if we can leave that up and we can move forward with it up there, or I can just close it out, in fact, because you'll be able to get this in other ways. And I'll stop sharing now and we can pick it up with our panelists and with Valerie. Um, we are we have the panelists ready to go and uh, we are gonna give them up to three minutes a piece. So can we actually, uh, we have Chris and Bernadette and Col uh, Colt. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lean on the person that we've got Bernadette up. Bernadette, are you are you comfortable talking now? Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to take notes because I'm expecting to be put on the firing line here, and I hope you do, because I have a lot to learn about this, and that's why you're here is to help us all okay, so, move this forward. So just a remind a reminder that Bernadette Muncy is a senior principal at Smith Group uh, in the Boston uh, office of the Smith Group. She has a very large portfolio on healthcare design. So Bernadette. Well, hello. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be part of this panel. Um, I really just learned about the ADAI uh, initiative I believe it was like last week, Valerie, when I met you for the first time, you came to our office in uh, Boston, Smith Group office, and uh, informed us of this initiative as well as a number of other things that we really uh, needed to be aware of as part of our uh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives at Smith Group. Um, it was a very well-received um, informational uh, presentation. So I asked, how can I get involved? As I'm sure many of you are also asking how you can get involved. Um, I have been 
as Valerie mentioned, a designer within the healthcare field for uh, about 18 years or so with experience in, in other market sectors before that. Um, I can't recall a significant amount of training in college uh, that related to accessibility, but I have had the opportunity uh, over the course of my practice to be friends with, to experience through their lenses some of the some of the the deficiencies in accessible design. And it's been something that I have been relatively passionate about. I'm sure maybe not as passionate as some of you who are experiencing some of these firsthand, but I am well aware that our that our aging population is going to increase the number of folks with disabilities and preparing our built environment to accept uh, and to comply with the regulations and to allow these folks to have equal uh, experiences in our built environment, I feel is very important. So I'm very excited to be part of this. Um, and I'm curious, I wrote in, in the chat, if there is additional information that, that we should be getting to NCARB perhaps to get them involved more in this initiative. I think you're already including them, but the test that we all as architects or tests rather that we all as architects take, like getting more accessibility requirements in there to build the knowledge of our younger and emerging architects, I think is very important. So I think that's, that's where I'm gonna leave it. Um, Thank you, Bernadette. We really appreciate it. And Bernadette has actually joined us from Chicago. She's she's traveling this week, um, <laughs> so we doubly appreciate your time and commitment. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn to my colleague and friend Chris Downey, uh, who is both a practitioner and somebody who's had quite extensive experience in teaching at the University of California at Berkeley. Chris, are you there? Valerie, may I interrupt? Yes, sure. Um, I believe Colt Brock is on a very tight timeline. Would it be okay if he were to respond next, if he's still available? He he was in very tight time in terms of his ability to be with us today. Uh, that's fine, Richard. Uh, Colt, are you there? Could you step in? Chris, my apologies. Colt, did you actually hear the presentation? I did, yes, I did. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Your The floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Um, and apologies, everyone, if I sound... <laughs> A bit bad. I'm uh, under the weather. We had a conference last week and it caught up to me, we'll say. Um, but thank you so much. My name is Colt Brock. Uh, I am the 2023-2024 president of the American Institute of Architecture Students. I am based out of Washington, D.C. right now with this role. And I completed my Bachelor's of Science of Architecture at Georgia Tech. Um, I'm currently on the licensure path, but not licensed. Um, and I just want to say thank you, Richard, um, for the great presentation and thank you everyone uh in the chat as well for a lot of great feedback and conversations Richard reached out to myself and other members of our leadership a few weeks back uh, in regards to supporting the ADAI initiative and we are definitely very excited to be continuing conversations about doing so um, for those of you that don't know what the American Institute of Architecture Students is we support anywhere from high school to PhD students in design programs around the world um we're a about a 5,000 member mm -hmm. organization, about 350 chapters. And this is something that is incredibly important to our organization. And just to kind of jump in, in a few different spaces, um, something that I think is great about this initiative is, is that it is not exclusively looking at the trad traditional methods and modes of encouraging change in curricular you know, uh, studies. We look at, you know, we have everything from high school students, community college students, four and five year students, master's students, PhD students. Um, but something I would say is, is continue to engage students and to those of you that are joining the call um, and just listening in and maybe just hearing about this program. Um, 
students have often been in Kindle might be able to <laughs> attest to some of this as well. If he's still here, um, uh, grassroots bottom up, uh, pressure from students have led to more curricular changes in schools than I have seen often top down, you know, pushes from maybe NAB or from NCARB or from the AI even. And so what I would encourage all of you to do is to reach out to student organizations, reach out to students of architecture that you know, share these resources, because it takes students getting together and, you know, putting pressure on their faculty and on their educators to want to make this change. Um, I was fortunate and unfortunate to be in school during uh, the pandemic and during 2020. And um, with all the things that took place, especially during 2020, uh, the changes that we saw in regards to social justice and design uh, came almost predominantly from the bottom up. And I think there is a lot of momentum and a lot of work already being done in the space of accessibility, um, but we need to get it in front of students and have them pushing it forward. Um, and so I just wanted to say thank you. Please reach out if you have any questions for me or how to get in contact with any students in your area. I'd be more than happy to help you connect. And thank you, Richard and Valerie, for the invitation today. Thank you, Colt. Thank you, Colt. Uh, nice articulation of the role of students. Uh, thanks very much. Now we'll go to Chris Downey. Hi, can you hear me? We can, Chris. We, we can't okay. see you. Oh, well, you're not missing much. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, uh, I can take. Oh, there you go. There you go. Start. There you go. There you are. All right. Okay. We've got you in front of us. All right. So, um, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks also, uh, Valerie, uh, for this opportunity and, and for, uh, to Richard for all this uh, tremendous work you're doing in this area. Uh, but I also want to give uh, an, a, a strong shout out to Colt and the work he's doing. And and this whole idea of it being sort of uh, grassroots, the power of the students to up manage, to push up to the profession, to pro push up to the professors, the schools, the administrators, to to demand more and to and to sort of seek things that are more relevant uh, and more appropriate uh, for their for their futures and their ways of thinking about architecture and design, and and that in my experience uh, as Interestingly, both as a practitioner, but also as in, in teaching at schools of architecture, is the problem isn't the students, the, the thirst from the students are there. When you look at students today, the interest in DEI or social justice, uh, mm -hmm. social justice in design, the passion is there. And, and it only needs to be linked to all the opportunities that are out there. And a big part of that, is is in in this sense of uh, inclusion, uh, universal design or social justice and design and environments that are suitable for all. And it's actually thinking about connecting back to the idea that that in architecture and design, it's not it's not really about uh, compliance with code. That's really important, but it's where that comes from, and where it comes from is that that connection between what you do as a designer, as an architect, and the environment that people will inhabit. And uh, in that, you know, it's, you can think about how a person with a disability isn't developed, isn't disabled in the environment and in until a barrier is put in their way. And who's responsible for those barriers? The designers. So, with that, there's a direct impact, there's a direct connection and connectivity between our work on the drawing boards or on the digital, on the pad, on the uh, display screen, and, and the environment in which uh, people occupy. And, and there's a real power in that. It's a power that our, our academic institutions don't necessarily embrace. And the power of the students, whether it's the student chapter of the AIA or NOMAS or whatever, is to push up and expect more from the profession, which might mean new and different professors. I am so tired of hearing about studios that have been run that are gonna take into consideration ADA. And then it's mentioned once or twice in a, in a, in a studio setting early on, and then it's done for the semester, it's done for the quarter. 
and, and to really trying to find those professors and empowering those professors within the curriculum to really make a real difference. And, and I guess in, in closing, I'll, I'll end up where I thought I was going to start, which is a tie back to something that Richard said early on about making it sexy. Uh, and I was reminded of a time I was uh, last fall, I was at, at dinner with uh, a niece and her husband in Boston, and she was reading, I'm blind, she was reading off, off the uh, menu to me, and the, the start of the menu was sexy starters. Guess what was the first thing under the category of sex, uh, sexy starters? Brussels sprouts. Who could imagine <laughs> Brussels sprouts in the, the headline of sexy starters? And that's something about thinking about how you can make it sexy, how you can make it appealing, how you can get people, you can give it a sense of gravity of people wanting to get to it, be, be engaged with it, participate in it. Yeah, as Richard said, you can't learn all those 500 pages, but you can embrace, you can uh, you can develop that passion to want to do it, to, to know where to turn and to know how to answer, ask the right questions and find the right answers and build that right, you know, and imagine that, that powerful, inclusive, uh, socially just environment. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Really appreciate it. Um, so we've heard from our respondents. It is now term, time to turn to our audience. There's still quite a crowd out there. And we've had an incredibly rich uh, discussion going on on chat. People have had a load of things to say. Um, and I promise we will actually save that uh, and, and make that available to the participants because it's a rich collection of ideas. Um, among those ideas, uh, is, is actually a reminder and a, sort of an urgent push to make sure that landscape architecture is included, um, that it is critically important. Uh, and, and I think this is partly an emphasis on the public realm um, and making sure that, that there is a non-negotiable baseline that everybody understands. Um, and I think... Um, uh, there's a number of people who've been very passionate about the role of um, thinking about people with sensory limitations, particularly people with, with hearing loss and who are culturally deaf, and the importance of embedding those things, not as an afterthought, but uh, as, as something you plan for from the get-go. Um, and I think that's very seldom done. Um, and I think uh, there's been a, an interesting set of questions about incentives such as design competitions, which always get a tremendous amount of attention. We need to be thinking about that. We, we did those years ago, but have not done one in a long time, and it might be time and attention well spent. Um, uh, looking at some of the things that um, folks are talking about, somebody has suggested um, developing a point system for accessibility. They're, they're suggesting something akin to uh, lead. I think uh, if I might just interject, one of my worries is I think that part of the disconnect of people engaging designers, engaging with the idea of accessibility as intrinsic to good design is the just tell me what I have to do response, which I find deadly and unattractive to designers in an extreme way. Um, we don't get to good design. Uh, and I think we need to be very careful that we've already got a load of standards. What we need to do is really embed an understanding of implementation and use of those standards for the purpose of good design. Um, it is not ever going to get far with just tell me what I have to do, which I think is one of the unfortunate byproducts 34 years after the passage of the ADA. God knows we need to know where to look but just tell me what I have to do has basically a message that my brain is turned off, just direct me. Uh, and I, I've not met a designer yet who actually has an appetite for that method of design. Um, and I think um, 
And I think there's been an interesting point here, Gail Ressler. Um, can we start to understand the design we aspire to is for everyone, not just people with disabilities, in quotes, uh, which smacks of othering. And I think people with disabilities uh, know that the standards focus on a kind of subset in people with disabilities. And, and there really needs to be an understanding that everybody doesn't self-identify. This really is about the human condition. But this baseline, this in the United States, you know, we work globally. In the United States, I have been very proud that we have a robust infrastructure to support accessibility as baseline compliance. And I think that is a, a, an invaluable asset. Um, and I think that's something that we need to be proud of and make sure that we're, we're doing. I have a, a comment here from our current Inclusive Design Fellow, Paul DeFazio, a recent MART graduate from Rice. Um, He's interested in the initiative, and I wonder about it as a piece of broader reform currently happening in design programs around disability. Um, is this initiative an ally to other progressive reforms within design education? And if so, how, for example, um, design approaches that come out of critical disability studies, which Paul is very much a, a ran, a, in, engaged in. Disability is a part of DEI. Uh, you may know or not know that federal policy uh, over the last four years has actually had um, accessibility as part of diversity, equity, and inclusion, though it is often ignored. Uh, it is also for folks like us that spend a great deal of our uh, attention in the cultural community, particularly with museums. It is the, the commitment of the American Association of Museums that it is DEAI. Um, and I think we really need to make sure that everybody's aware of this. Um, Valerie, I might, I might add to that. Please, if, Richard. Yeah, if, yeah you know, the... Um, <clears throat> The AIA has categorized in their new strategic plan uh, when they talk about accessibility, they, the term they use is other under, other underrepresented groups. When we talk about othering, that gentleman's comment earlier about othering, and you, you brought it right down to the important point of the basics. We do need to include everyone in our designs, obviously, but as we begin to get distracted by inclusive, or other design ways of thinking, oftentimes that diminishes and, and dilutes the need for enhancing the basics of accessible design. And so <clears throat> when we talk about going beyond that, I sat on the International Code Council Assisted Toileting and Bathing Committee. And I can tell you that this same person mentioned research, or, or what's based on research, uh, and, and I can tell you that the research that went behind assisted toileting and bathing took years and was applied research that informed the committee making the decisions for the code development and now the new code provisions. So these things, as I mentioned earlier, do not happen in a vacuum. And the people involved in this were, in fact, some people with disabilities. So I don't want to get too far into inclusive or other design ways of thinking. They're very important. But today, the idea is enhancing our education of students in accessible design and getting them exposed to the minimum documents and to the culture behind all of this, including inclusive, et cetera. But exposure to the minimums and exposure to the cultural understandings. I can't let that stand without a comment, Richard. Please. We spend a great deal of time on the anthrop uh, the, the anthropometric, or not on the anthropometric, I'm sorry, on the demographics of disability. It is critically important to our message, and I think it is part of what, um, mm -hmm. uh, what Bernadette heard from us last week. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize who we are not paying attention to in the mm -hmm. current standards. We recommend absolute compliance, non-debatable for accessibility. That is a floor, but it is a floor that does not heed the reality of today about the experience of disability. Okay. And the, the reality of the intersection of race and culture and disability and gender and sexual identity with disability cannot be ignored. Instead of one out of every four adults, it's one out of every three adults. Yeah. We have the highest rates of disability in communities of color, particularly low-income communities. I am not willing to forfeit 
the significance of those realities in today's America. So I, dis I respectfully disagree, sir. I appreciate your, we had this conversation earlier, so I knew this was coming. Uh, you know, Valerie, I'm, I'm obviously, the question is how much can you bite off and chew in an initiative? So here, bringing the ADAI forward is the first step of that basic, of that ground floor non-negotiable, right? And then you can take it beyond that into the cultural domain of, of anything you want. But there's a cultural domain and a sociological application to disabilities as well. I'm not, again, this is not meant to disparage any other approach to DEI, because we've already got states like Texas and Georgia and Florida all trying to kill DEI at our universities. I was on our, our EDI commission at the University of Missouri, and I was on the state of Texas uh, Society of Architects EDI Commission. There's people out there fighting that fight for EDI. I'm fighting the fight for what we're going through today, and I don't have the bandwidth personally to begin to say, how does this, how is, how is gender impacted or how is race impacted? Yeah, it is. That's not where I'm going with this, as you understand. And we had this conversation. So I appreciate, yeah. and, you know, obviously there are people here who can take this take this to another level and, and begin to integrate those other concerns of DEI. That's not what I'm doing with this ADAI. And, and, and I'm taking anything away from a baseline, a reliable, non-negotiable baseline of accessibility. And we completely endorse that. And we believe that it is still quite at risk in people knowing what to do. Yeah. Um, I'm actually just checking here. Um, I, I actually am going to uh, let my board member, Sally Levine, an architect um, and professor of architecture. Uh, the initiative is to create an architectural culture that wants to design for the greatest number of people possible. Then the ADA is of interest. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, Sally has been a practitioner on the architecture side as an academic uh, and on the interior design side. And I think we've seen in some ways uh, more embrace on the interior design side, and that's not what we're talking about today. But I think that the conversion opportunity there has already occurred. Um, and I think we need to be looking at, um, we need to be persisting on architecture and on landscape architecture. I'm seeing Richard, Sa Richard Sa Scaff is saying to everyone, our access is not a baseline. I'm not sure what Richard means. Can you uh, play that out a little bit, Richard? I am saying it's a baseline for going beyond uh, compliance with accessibility standards and codes. Richard Scaff from San, San Francisco. Uh, it's, you know, it's mandatory and I hate to use that word. I like non-negotiable. Somebody else used a different term. If you want your project approved and you want to meet the minimums and you want to you want to get your building permit, you want to get your loan from the bank, whatever it is, <clears throat> you're going to have to meet them. That's all I mean by baseline. And and uh, I'm not sure what what Richard means. I think he I think you've responded to it. And I think um, for us it means that uh, there is still work to be done to create a world that works for everyone and that gives people the kind of facilitating environments they need to thrive. Um, and there's a lot of people have joined us today who are stressing that if this is going to work, people with lived experience of disability have got to be part of the, the learning and they've got to be part of the education process. Um, and, and, and Sarah from St. Louis uh, stresses, accessible design is about options and choices. That is really the overarching goal yeah. of, of this work. And, you know, we talked about uh, an ad hoc committee, you know, getting a lot of the players together here who are involved, and that may still happen. And, and absolutely, persons with impairments, disabilities <clears throat> are critical. Nothing about us without us. This is not going to move forward in a vacuum <clears throat> for people with disabilities. It's going to move forward with people who can contribute from an, an, an end user standpoint who understand. Chris Downey was our um, keynote at our symposium in Denver, I think it was, Chris. And, uh, and he made that 
point very, very clearly to our symposium attendees and participants that uh, none of this is going to happen <clears throat> without direct input from people who understand it from their viewpoint. Marsha Maz is a good example, who's been highly, highly contributory into the program itself to up to date. We have an anonymous uh, uh, attendee. Is there any hope in the future of combining ICC standards and ADA standards to clarify and make them easier to understand so that designers don't need to have several code books open at once? Wow, I love this. You know, and I'll tell you, my jaw dropped at symposium. Marsha Maz was our opening keynote. Marsha is the former technical director at the U.S. Access Board, and she's now the director of disability at United Spinal. And as, as our keynote, and because she, I guess, is retired now from the Access Board, she made the statement that isn't it about time that the 2010 ADA standards and the federal government stepped out of accessible design regulations, provisions, designs in general, and let the, let the International Code Council pick it up? I, I, as I say, my jaw dropped. Is that going to happen? Who knows? I mean... You're talking about the federal government, <laughs> um, but the 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 ICC meets at, meets all, several times a year, votes annually, revises the documents annually, republishes every three years for the building code and every five for the A117. Uh, much more dynamic, and certainly uh, have as an example with HUD. If you use any of the modern building codes. I think 2009 forward, you automatically are in safe harbor with fair housing now. So there's a good example of how that might work. So I, I want to hop onto that one um, because this is something that I've been curious about as well. Um, I, I find that having a federal standard is actually important because it, it overarches throughout the country, whereas the ICC standards the, are adopted by state and sometimes by even smaller jurisdiction. Um, I recently did some code review uh, in the state of Illinois and found that there is at least one city in the state of Illinois that still uses BOCA from who knows how long ago for their building codes. And so having that, that federal standard, I feel is important, but what I think would be more helpful is to update the ADA standard to the more recent research that the ICC A117.1 is at. I you mentioned the anthropometric study that was done by Dr. Steinfeld. And I just, I don't understand how we can still be utilizing a standard federally that was based off of a, a study of like 40 individuals using wheelchairs in the 1970s where the the technology the mechanics the variety of disabilities and disability tools have have changed so much um and i, I know this is probably not the forum for that but i, I feel very strongly that we should be designing to a more modern and updated standard than 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 we currently are, for sure. Well, the Access Board has to deal with politics, and their work yeah. and the DOJ go through the Office of Management and Budget, which can take years. Uh, when Dr. Pavathron took over the board um, six seven years ago, I asked him that exact question, and their focus at that time was getting the new Public Rights of Way Accessibility Guidelines, the PROAG out and revised and out. Now that just happened and that took six years. So they can't move as quickly as an organization like the ICC. And you know, again, where this goes, it's anybody's guess. But I agree with you, Bernadette. Uh, we're, you know, we're working from a 1945, 1950 standard on design. And uh, there's nothing stopping you from using the building code and then applying, let's say section 103 equivalent facilitation of the 2010 standards and saying, yeah, I've got this 67 inch turnaround and it's equivalent to the 60 inch uh, in, in the 2010 standards. So I meet it, or you could apply it in dozens of ways, including assisted toileting and bathing, the whole new set of principles 
on adult changing tables, all of those things that are new to the code can still be worked into your project and compliant to the federal standards because they go so far above. And that's what the Harmonization Committee has been up to. I want to I want to let Richard Scaff um, uh, share with us his his thinking when he said not just baseline and I think uh, I think it's a different understanding of the term baseline. He he is making a point that um, I meant that all of the state and federal standards and codes must be met, not just those codes and standards that provide basic access. That was not in any way what I was talking about. I was talking about a floor upon which you can go beyond it. Um, but he is saying for the 15 years with the city of San Francisco, I interacted with all of those involved with projects. And there were failures at every level from architects to contractors and building plan checkers and inspectors. Access is still not accepted throughout the building facility communities. And I think it's important to just let somebody who has been a very important leader uh, in these issues in a major American city have his say. Uh, and and a, a, another couple of people are basically just longing for um, more participation and for people to recognize that, that demanding this in government, demanding it in local government is something that also can make a difference. Um, and and it, you know, it's difficult to get people to commit to those volunteer roles in things like commissions on disability, but they, they can be effective when they are full of people on fire. They make an enormous difference. Uh, so I think that's another important message. Um, Uh, here's an, uh, somebody who's saying the key, I believe, to access to increase safety, show respect to the to, to people with disabilities, and improve mental health, so that people with disabilities are welcomed in all communities. These are challenges I have endured as a disabled individual. I mean, I think I think that that, that people feel um, disabled by the environment. This is actually the global gold standard of defining disability. It is about whether the individual with a functional limitation can interact in a holistic way with the physical, the information, the communication, the attitudinal and the policy environment. It is really thinking about our power as designers to create a context that allows people to live the lives they choose. And that's where we fall so short so often. So I think I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, we, we are, um, at uh, an hour and 45 minutes, which is a remarkable amount of time. And I very much appreciate a large crowd of people who have stayed with us, including, did I just see somebody uh, just, uh, we, we, we will let our friends in Japan go to sleep. Um, but we appreciate that they have stuck with us to the wee hours of the morning. Um, and thank you all. We will share uh, this whole presentation will be available as an accessible webcast posted to our website when we can edit the transcript. But we will also sh share with you this fascinating conversation that has been, been very active throughout the session today on chat. So we really appreciate it. Um, and actually somebody, uh, this may be something that we want to leave it with. Somebody is, is basically talking about uh, if you want to get something done, um, convince people it's the right thing to do and then give them credit for doing it. So I think we can all sign on to that idea um, and make it the idea of the decision makers that they had it. But we will credit Richard for his energy and his passion for this um, now uh, and over the last couple of years. And we, we hope for his success in the future. So thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, and we will look forward to the next opportunity. Richard, be well and thank you, Valerie. Everyone. Be well all.